everybody. If I'm a little winded, I was out spreading uh, soil in the garden. Got a little bit of my heart rate up. Uh, rock and roll. So spring is springing all around. Although we've got a couple nights showing up yet that are going to freeze. We're getting ready to plant trees, veggies, and all kinds of neat things. And working the soil at this point. So welcome. Delighted you're here. The, uh, the soil seems like it might be something disconnected from what we're doing with this work, but actually it is a part and parcel of being holy. And holy has nothing to do with being down on your knees with your hands folded. It means that you take care of every level of the energy system that you're aware of. And one of the things that I've become very aware of since we have uh, started getting our hands in the soil here five years ago and doing a lot of study is recognizing that you can't grow food on dirt. And if you're going to be holy, you've got to have food. You've got to have the nutrients that come and the micronutrients that come with actual food. And you can't grow it on dirt. And just about every commercial farm in the country, in the world, you know, one of the first things they do is they pour 10 gallons of glyphosate on the soil to turn it into dirt, to kill everything in it so there's no life there, there's no competition. Nothing to make nutrients available. <clears throat> and of course, if you can convince a farmer to do that, then you can convince the farmer that he's going to need your NPK, your three-nutrient mix that will make vegetables look like vegetables and fruit look like fruit, but they'll be empty. There'll be no nutrition in it. And then you can convince him because those things are so weak and the bugs are going to come into attack. Then you can convince them that you need their, they need your, your chemicals to kill off the bugs. And the cycle begins or, or goes to the next level. And so everything from the nutrition on up, you know, if you register for our uh, codependence to interdependence communication practicum, at this point it's the only intensive we have available for self-study. Part and parcel of that program is a total food program. We have a private Facebook page and an app for doing a whole introduction and how to prepare any actual food. So that's another part of this holistic approach, being uh, aware of the energetic patterns that are natural to us as human beings <clears throat> on a holistic level, being aware of the energetic patterns that don't belong in us, being aware of the language that allows us to comprehend the actuality of the creation in which we live, move, and have our being. So lots of things to be considered, lots of things to be taken into consideration, and here we go. So, Ms. Jeannie, uh, before I move into, we were talking or we were going through the uh, the writing in the Enlightenment book on Nafsha, on the soul, uh, to build some brain cells in that direction. And uh, before I step back to that, wondering if you have anybody in the phone queue with a hand up or anything happening in the chat room. It's quiet on both fronts, and I looked, and we've answered all the emails that we've received so far, so I would say go for it. Awesome. So I'm going to back up just a little bit, so we'll, we'll cover and catch everybody up on. <clears throat> if, you are, if you have a copy of the Enlightenment book, we're on page 86. We're in the glossary dictionary and looking at the meanings of first century Aramaic words. And the word we're working with at this point is the word nafsha that has been translated by the Greeks, or pardon me, should I say um, interpreted by the Greeks, because there's no translation there. You can't translate a word that doesn't exist in a language. You, you can make up something that might seem similar, but what we're working to do is to build the brain cells for what, the Aramaic mind would naturally assume was the conversation because they had the brain cells for that. And you listen to Yeshua, Miriam, saying that in order to understand, make use of his teaching, you have to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. If you've got Greek eyes and ears, then the Aramaic will speak to you as the script, ancient scriptures describe it in stammering lips in another tongue. It'll sound like a foreign language. 
And in the name of love, you watch what people have done. You know, they've gone off and they flagellate themselves. They beat each other. They kill each other. They kill, they kill people in order to save their souls. I mean, that's what happens when you don't have the brain cells for the words as they fell from the man's lips. A mind that comes from a violent filing system, from an hostility and fear base, Here's words based in love and interprets them through hostility and fear, and we get crazy time. 32,000 sects of so-called Christianity, all sure that they've got the right brain cells firing. Yeshua says you've got to have his brain cells. You've got to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. He's not talking about physical eyes and ears. I think he can fairly safely assume most everybody in his audience had what we call eyes and ears. Certainly they were blind and deaf, but most everybody had the eyes and ears. What he was saying is you've got to have the brain cells. You've got to have the content that matches his. And well, I'll just take a quick run back to the beginning. Of, I know we've got some new folks on. One of the first things I do in, when I do a uh, an introduction to the Aramaic is I tell a little story about the fellow who wanted to come and uh, do an intensive with us, and he's from Russia and only speaks Russian. And, and one of the participants in the intensives happens to be one of the best translators of Russian into English and English into Russian in the world. And I asked that person, I know he's got an extra room in his house, would you mind housing this person? You know, pick him up, translate for him, drop him off at the airport when we're finished, would you do? And they're just, of course, delighted to have that opportunity. And at the end of the week, after we've met, I, I want this gentleman who came all the way from Russia to do this workshop to know how much I appreciate him and what I think of him. So I tell our translator, because I don't speak any Russian, uh, that I'd like him to tell our new participant that I think he's really cool. And in his best Russian accent, he turns to this fellow and says, Michael thinks you've got a low body temperature. He translated my words perfectly. Didn't say a word about what I meant, but he translated my words perfectly. What do you suppose this fellow from Russia is going to think when, when I'm, I, I, I think he's got a low body temperature? I mean, might he be insulted? Might he be confused? I mean, what kind of things go on? Look at most people when they hear the Greek translations of Yeshua's words. How much confusion, how much this is crazy stuff goes on. They see people condemning little kids to hell. And they go, what? What? In the name of a creator named love, that's what you do. Oh, that's churchianity, is it? Bizarre. And so our objective here is to get back to the first century meanings of those Aramaic words and in particular, there's some words that were left in their original Aramaic elegance rather than trying to put them into English. And it's about three pages to break down this word, nafshi, to get to some sort of a comprehension of what this word is that describes human life. By the way, if you don't have a copy of the book and you'd like to get one, uh, you can go to our catalog and order it. And if you do that, it's $25, and then the, the, the catalog automatically, it's out of our hands, adds shipping. However, we've decided for people who are participating in this, if you'd like to get a copy of it, if you just go to our website to the Donate button, which is at the bottom of the page, and donate $26, it goes through PayPal, and PayPal takes about a buck and a half out of it. So if you donate $26, we'll pay the shipping for the books, 25 and and we'll get it out to you right away. So again, we're on uh, page 20, or pardon me, 84. And I'm going to start back up the second paragraph. Or let's go to the first paragraph, actually. From the, from the above uses, it should be abundantly clear that Nafsha, at the time of Yeshua, was generally understood as the control entity behind the physical, mental, and behaving self. Hmm. So there is a self, and most people think, I am self, and I control everything. But in Aramaic, that's not the thinking. In Aramaic, they understood that there was a being 
that was not the mental, physical, and behaving self. And then recognize that in Aramaic, the words that in, or the ideas in our culture that separate cause and effect, which has people think they can get away with doing a behavior without experiencing the effect of that behavior. Where in the Aramaic, the Aramaic mind wouldn't even think of that. The Aramaic mind understood that you engage in a cause and the effect is automatic. It's just it's not something you can escape from. So with the unification of cause and effect implicit in Aramaic and the unification of the control source for the mental and the physical Im Im implicit in these uses, Nafsha, therefore, stands for all mental and physical conditions and the control source of mental and physical development. This span of meaning lays a basis for translations of the varied English words such as soul, self, itself, and life. So the Aramaic, again, this word was left in Aramaic because there are so many confusing ideas, but we're looking to get a deeper sense of what this word means in the Aramaic. Also, it may be noted that there is, in the above quoted uses, the implied suggestion that nafsha may have a quality of performance meaning. With the leper, the instruction to show his nafsha, you know, the the uh, when when the leper was cleansed, Yeshua didn't say, "Go show your body to the to the priests." He said, "Go show your nafsha." It's the Aramaic word. So the instructions to show his nafsha suggest his nafsha might have changed for the better, or might have improved its performance. With respect to nafsha of the city, the house, or the kingdom, an implication of correctness, of truth, in addition to controlling power, envelops the meaning of the word. This implication of quality of effect, mixed with the intrinsic tie to truth, is borne out in other statements. But these are instructional statements of Yeshua, apparently intended to inform, to teach, rather than to communicate through the use of a mutually understood term. So he's expanding the understanding of this idea of nafsha in Aramaic. In Matthew 6.25, the quality of performance, fact of control, and tied to truth elements of nafsha all appear where he gives instructions on making things easier for one's nafsha. Do not burden your nafsha over what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what clothes you shall wear. Is nafsha, not nafsha greater than nourishment, your life greater than garments? So this use of the word implies that nafsha represents our lives. And because in Aramaic cause and effect are not separated, it reaches into many different directions. In line with the thought of Matthew 6.25, he indicates in Matthew 6.33, the results achieved by Nafsha varies in conformity with the proprietary of an individual's goal or set of will, where in Matthew 6.33 he states, seek before everything the kingdom of love, the community of love. And that, for me, implies it's saying you've got to become aware from the source of your being. And when you gather all of the faculties that belong to your being, everything else you want will follow. If you go out into the world and try to get things without gathering the cause, the source of being, in full, without full contact with your nafsha, then you're functioning out of a partial comprehension and creative process. Hence, things tend to go crazy. So this implication that nafsha 
If it is to function, property must be accompanied by a proper alignment of human will it is in no way denied by any of the communicated, communicating uses of the word. So I think we could, could safely say in this seek first is gather all that your nafsha includes And I'm taking a slow here because I'm making notes. Before you go forward into your world, if you go into what most people think of as a self, that is an, an image in the mind based on experience of who we are, and you remember that Yeshua says in order for you, Nafsha, to live, and there I think we could safely comprehend that live means in order to become a fully conscious creator in your life, you've got to gather all aspects of your nafsha, all levels of yourself from that community of love. And the primary uh, expression of that self would be that of active present love. And so gathering fully every aspect of one's own being before working to bring something into expression in the world becomes necessary. And if we're functioning out of the false self, the self, remember, Yeshua says, in order for you to live, you've got to die. In order for you, Nafsha, to come into full expression, that in you which is based in an image of yourself that is only partial has got to die. That self has got to go. And then he says, in essence, i got the tools for you. Not I've got a dogma, not I've got a doctrine, but I've got the tools for you. So in Matthew eleven twenty nine, he says, take upon yourself the yoke upon me and learn from me that I am serene and peaceful in mind. And you will find for yourself serenity for your nafsha. In other words, you're going to be freed of mental stress. So what he's saying is, hey, guys, I've got a formula. i got some tools. And sadly, this is the piece that is mostly missing from the Greek translations. Some of the imagery comes through of, you know, what we want to have. But the tools, and in this statement he's saying, here, yep, I, I've got a load for you to carry. But take it on, and I'll show you how to achieve what I have. It's interesting, that passage, which you've heard me to re refer to often, where a number of disciples, besides the 12 we're usually familiar with, come together with Yeshua. And in essence, they say, what do we need to do to please the Creator? And Yeshua replies to them, and... half of the disciples recoil with thoughts and words like too hard a saying, who can understand that? And they leave and they never come back. And they made up a happy song about how, well, he's going to fix it for you. you. You don't have to do any work. No, when he told us we had all that work to do, when he told us we had to clean up our own minds and actually do our work, we said, too hard a saying, nobody can understand that. We'll just go off and we'll create a theology where we say, you get to fix it all for us. He didn't say he was going to fix it all for us. He said, you need to take on my yoke. I got some instructions for you. And if you listen to what he said when they asked that specific question in that event, his reply was an Aramaic idiom where he said, you must eat my body and drink my blood. Now, in today's world, that would be the commonly understood idea of take communion. Now, you know, a little wine, a little wafers, what's hard about that? Why would half of the disciples 
actually leave and never come back saying too hard a saying. Obviously, it wasn't about wine and wafers. You know, you hear a lot of people like, oh, yeah, got to do communion, got to do communion, got to do communion, got to do... You do. You do have to do communion. But it's not about wine and wafers. It's about taking on the yoke of the man, Yeshua, and doing the work that he said had to be done to return to the truth of who you are, to gather all aspects of your nafsha, to forgive or to free yourself of all parts of your mind that are based in hostility or fear. And then he says, what are you going to find in Matthew eleven twenty nine? Oh, here's where the serenity will exist that will flow throughout your structure. You're going to be freed of the excessive mental stress that destroys most people. I'm going to show you how to be free of the interference from carbon-based memory. So in this case, he's given an instructional speech and indicates one's nafsha may, be, may experience unnecessary difficulty in conflict unless will and goals be conformed to certain rules or guidelines. In other words, you need to know how the control mechanism operates. You need to know how to work on the level of cause. And if you're working on the level of cause is an error, then your effects are going to reflect those errors. So then, you know, it goes on to say, however, there is no suggestion here that an option with burdens is less an option than one without burdens. It's not going to change your essential nature. Your essential creative nature is love is going to remain. But if you don't know how to take charge of, if you don't know the rules for governing your own mind, then you're going to experience stresses that are beyond reasonable. This is here. Got some tools for you. Take on my yoke. In Matthew 10.39, it's indicated that nafsha operating without these certain guidelines will seek to operate as an nafsha. In other words, one's going to go into oblivion, going to be rendered unconscious and without creative power. So in that particular passage, he states, he who finds his own nafsha shall, shall lose it, and he who loses his own nafsha for my way shall find it. The control mechanism for operating human life must come from conscious spiritual awareness. So Yeshua is saying that we need to align our will for this perfect life, to be guided by he offers the words. He says, my words are your perfect life. He's saying, I've got some tools. I've got, I'm going to instruct you in them, and here are the words. But who in the West has ever heard his words? Who knew that it would take three pages of reading to understand one word, nafsha? The word that describes who you are and how you operate. And you remember, you know, it's kind of in alignment with that idea. He says, many will come speaking my name, and I'm going to say, I knew you not. Who are you? Yeah, you're going, Jesus, Jesus. That's not what I asked for. He says, why do you not do what I said you had to do? And so if our nafsha is out of alignment with the words that convey the understanding of how to manage your life, then you're going to be out of alignment with what Yeshua was teaching. And on to page 87. To lose the effect of one's nafsha, then, appears to be the result. If that nafsha itself is not under a will, serving proper guidelines... However, it should be noted that nothing so far indicates positively that one's nafsa or a city's nafsa is destroyed by such failure. Now, there's that threat of eternal damnation. But that's not implied in his words. 
Instead, it would appear that its effect may not may be lost, causing difficulties of a physical and or mental nature if there's no proper conformity of will. But the entity itself would appear to continue to exist, even though disconnected from control in contact with the self. Thus, the quality implications surrounding these uses of the word nafsha appear to relate not so much to the quality of the entity as to its achieved results. You know, and they said, how do you tell where somebody's at? In essence, we could say, how do you tell what somebody's nafsha has been doing? He says, you look at the fruit. You look at the results being produced. So the case of a poor nafsha, reflecting not so much the quality of the entity as the achieved results. The cause of poor results is laid not on a poor quality of nafsha, but improper will or goal. And in the Aramaic, the word will refers to a spiritual faculty which is designed to be used consciously to manage our minds. Most people are brought into the world and their behaviors are managed by their minds rather than their nafsha managing their minds. So he was laying out a system where your created essence managed goals which by so doing manage the output of your mind and alignment on track with purpose is going to produce a life that is desirable to the nafsha. Knock the spiritual faculty of will and nafsha out of the picture and you get people doing all kinds of crazy. And Matthew, and, and of course, there we, we come full circle in recognizing that if the will faculty has been off base and has produced crazy results, how do you correct it? How do you fix such a thing? Oh, it's easy. It's called forgiveness. Well, what's the essence of forgiveness? Managing your mind by managing your goals. And in particular, to recognize that if your perceptual mind is generating behavior guidance that's off base with your human life, then you want to collapse that particular quality of energy from your mind. You want to just literally cause it to collapse. How do you do that? You recognize that the constructs of the mind of Adam, Adamos, the red clay, are nothing but constructs. Those constructs always reflect first the internal conditions in the mind who is constructing reality that way, constructing their perception that way. And if the reality construct is off base with love, then it cannot align, cannot support, and will tend to create all kinds of crazy things out of alignment with love. If you found yourself doing that, if you come from a long line of people who've been doing that, which most of us have, then you're going to have to engage in, in a significant amount of forgiveness work to remove the goals that are off base with your true purpose and your true being. It's going to be part of the process of healing. That's the forgiveness work. That's the work process. process. And you notice the core of forgiveness has to do with removing from the mind that which is causing the mind to do what it's doing. Forgiveness, canceling a goal that drives the mind to some sort of pain perception. And when that pain perception has its cause, its goal removed, that pain perception collapses. And when that pain perception collapses, it collapses in on its own root and gives you access to what underlies the construct of the mind so that that energetic pattern can be directly healed. 
and whatever is inappropriate removed. So clearly, in this instruction, the quality of human performance is directly tied to the quality of what is willed over nafsha, that fundamental organizing and controlling core of mind and body. These instances of the use of the Aramaic concept nafsha by one who well understood its meaning gives us a fairly precise understanding of the term. Nafsha is the controlling core, the managing agent, the source of physical and mental development, and also because cause and effect are one may be used to designate the results of that operation or that action. The same may be applied to any functioning entity involving human beings, as for a house, a city, a country. Well, when, when the state was made a house divided against itself, it was actually a house divided against its nafsha, that is the controlling source can't stand it's going to fall because without all the faculties that are available from that higher state of being the mind goes off with half information and half knowledge and ends up producing half results so while every human has an offshoot by virtue of his ex or her existence, the results achieved by this controlling entity will be impaired by its subordination to an improper will. And again, once again, the will is that faculty with which goals are managed, and through indirection, the mind is managed. So when the nafsha is subordinated to an improper will in which an event, behavior, ideation, and or physical well-being will deteriorate. In other words, we're going to end up in a disease process. We do this to ourselves. And you go back and that statement is made, with man, death began. If the controlling entity, the nafsha, were in alignment with truth and had a mind that understood its its place in the process, there would be no disease. Man made death up. We initiated the process by going out of alignment with who we are. Looking into the realm of psychology, a few points can now be clarified with respect to this control entity for humans and human endeavor. Nafsha, apparently, can control the mind and body, which are themselves already control controlled at the subconscious level. Nafsha is, therefore, located within the unconscious, below and behind the directly controlling functions of the subconscious. This is, of course, an absolute necessity from a time sequence standpoint. If Nafsha, part Nafsha participates in the physical formation of the subconscious, it is implied in the above uses of the term. And... For me, what that ends up resulting in is recognizing that the unconscious condition, there's a difference between subconscious and sub unconscious. Subconscious is information that is available, but is not firing off at a level where I'm aware of it at the moment. So if I said, what's the front door of your house look like? My voice set up frequency. The energy from my voice was transferred to air molecules, through a microphone, through a transmitter, caused what's called a speaker in your phone or your whatever you're listening on to cause air molecules to move, caused a drum in your ear to vibrate, and certain brain cells fired. And those brain cells that fired are going to tend to become your behavior. So if I say, what's the front door of your house look like? Information that a moment ago was subconscious. It's there. Its amplitude is turned up, and you become aware of, oh, yeah, it's ornate. There's a glass window in it, and, you know, the doorbell looks like this, and the knocker looks like this. That's, I mean, you weren't thinking about that 45 seconds ago, 
And if I said, what's your favorite item of clothing? You know, what do you really, what, what is it that when you get into it, you really feel comfortable and feel good? A moment ago, that information was subconscious. Now it's become conscious. But you're not focusing on what your door looks like. Conscious and conscious are changing places all the time. Unconscious is a different story. That's what's hidden. That's what we hide from ourselves. And when we step into this process, into this game of denial, remember denial, when I think or speak as though something outside of me is the cause of what's moving inside of me, I'm in denial, and I dissociate from the content of my own mind, and therefore I take what should be subconscious and therefore available to me anytime I want to look at it, and I make of it unconscious material because I've instructed my mind it's not allowed to use that. When the unconscious dynamics take, pardon me, dynamic takes over, that's when one is in trouble. Hence, being part of the lower unconscious is not usually capable of direct contact with our reasoning minds, nor can our reasoning minds directly contact it. Nafsha cannot execute its natural control function properly if the controlling will is not harmonious with proper guidelines. It would, however, produce quality results with mind and body if the controlling will is harmonious with proper guidelines. And now we come up with, and this, this particular text is a part of our Laws of Living course. And Laws of Living not being law as in the Greek idea of law being the rule of a superior, but law as in the, the Aramaic definition would be the way things work. So to understand the law in Aramaic is to understand the way things work. And what this material is attempting to do is to assist in building brain cells. And I'll just share for me that several of these essays I mean, I can go back 30, 40 years ago, and I read them, and I reread them, and I reread them, and I reread them. And each time I read them yet today, I get a new insight into the, the genius of what was being taught. And then to the top of page 88, the fact of Ruka de Kucha exerting its outward force in harmony with the divine will and human desires exerting their force inward generates an interface where they meet, and if the two sets of forces are not in harmony, there's going to be trouble. What is scribed or formed upon the interface within a human mind is the history of its life. Scribing truly so as to harmonize the whole mind and man's desires with a rook of force is theologically speaking the purpose of human life. So to come into harmony with our true nature and the elemental forces, remember rukha, rukha to kucha, that kucha is the root of the Hebrew word kosher which means that which is proper for humans. So there is in us an elemental force that will guide us as to what is proper for us as humans. And if we're not in harmony with that force, then we'll go off doing all kinds of other things and wonder why life is so traumatized and traumatic. Man can no more sense directly, pardon me, sense or directly contact this Rukha force within him with his instruments, then he can contact the three creative forces whose impact in the physical world may be noted. And if you go back and remember the introduction, we talked about earth, air, wind, and fire. And then there's this elemental force for, for humans. Now, we say, and, and when Yeshua was talking about this elemental force, he was talking to one of the elders of the temple, and, and the guy says, well, wait, wait a minute, I, what are you talking about? And, and Yeshua says, what, you, you, one of the elders of Israel, you don't know what this is? You don't know what we're talking about? He 
these elemental forces. And there is, according to Yeshua, an elemental force for that which is proper for you and I as human beings. If we don't harmonize with that, if we don't have access to that, then what will tend to guide us is whatever has gone on in our genes. And I think we can fairly easily surmise when we look at the history of what the last 75 years, humans have murdered over 175 million people on the planet. People are starving to death, war, divorce, separation. Obviously, something's out of harmony here. If you're out of harmony with your nafsha, if you don't know what your purpose is, it's going to be hard to align. And when you think of life as an energy system, you know, energy systems don't bring through more energy by efforting. Energy systems bring through more energy by aligning. So when I align my will with that elemental force in me, Ruka, for that which is proper, then life tends to change. And so with that particular elder from the, from the synagogue, he, he uses an example that was understandable to him. He said, well, we, we know the wind. You know, you put your hand out here and, gee, you can feel the wind. You know there's a thing called wind, but you don't know what it is. The only way you know there's such a thing, like nobody knows what the wind is. Talk to the scientists. Tell me what wind is. Uh, we don't know. But we know from the effects that it creates that it's here. When you start to pay attention and you find yourself in a situation of difficulty and you ask for guidance from Ruka and you listen, and the listening may not be literal words, but it may simply be an inclination in a certain direction. And when you start listening to that and you follow its guidance, you'll know just as surely as the person who holds their hand up in the wind that there is an elemental force going on, even though you don't know what it is. And so that's what Yeshua is attempting to do with this whole instruction. And so there are a variety of, you know, for again, we're on page 83, or pardon me, 88, there are a variety of different variations on this word nafsha in, in different passages, and it is translated variously as my own selfhood, your nafsha, uh, his own nafsha, its nafsha, his nafsha, your nafsha. So this the word nafsha has to do with the truth of who we are as human beings. And so it's the, the objective here to understand is to be in alignment with this feminine elemental force called Ruka Dukutcha to bring it into expression. And we are at about the last 10 minutes. That was fast. So I'm going to open the gate to questions. Is this all making sense for everyone? Does anyone have a question about anything we've been doing? Does anyone need support with anything? Our call-in number, if you're on one of those stations where we can't see you, is 563-999-3581. If you call that number, you're listening to the show directly, and then if you push 1, that'll put a hand up in the phone queue, and Jeannie will know you want to ask a question. And we have a hand up. Great. Let's say hello to the hand. I believe it's KME618. You're on the air. Hey, guys. Welcome. How's everything How are you? I am... Awesome. I am working in my purpose fully. I am just creating this series has been phenomenal for me to pull, like, all of my skills that I've gathered throughout my life. Like, I feel like what I'm doing right is gathering to create my little paradise in southern Missouri. 
And the more um, intently I am speaking my words, and I've always wanted to learn Spanish. I have a little Spanish. I took French in high school, and I I think I only took like one semester. I didn't walk away with much, but it's in there. You know, it's like you always said that everything as we're driving down the highway is in our minds, everything that spoke in the universe, all of that. And that's the energy I'm creating in right now. This paradise, this little piece of paradise in Missouri that I'm carving out is going to be miraculous. I am seeing, um, once we get our home done, building a beautiful park-like Celestian Prophecy setting in Southeast Missouri. Um, I watched nice. it. I watched Celestial nice. Prophecy um, last night. Matt and I watched it and um, realized... You watched the movie? I, I was really Prophecy? tired. Pardon me? I, I'm just clarifying. You watched the movie last night you were saying? You watched Celestial Prophecy? Right, because I've been. It keeps Is coming back. To okay, me I was to just watch it. Right, cool. to watch it again. I had watched it when it first came out in '93. Cool. So I was in that movie, you know. You were. I was. I was on the set, and I got to play in two scenes, and I ended up on the cutting room floor. <laughs> oh, I never yeah. knew that. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Well, remember, if you look at the uh, introduction to my book, it was done by Jim Redfield. uh, I was going to say that. I've been thinking a lot about him and, you know, just the Celestine Prophecy and you. And I never did understand why, how, what your connection was with him, you know. And He he was a student of mine. When he was writing Celestine Prophecy, that's where the Aramaic text comes from. And actually, wow. with the first mm-hmm. books that he printed, it was a self-printed book initially. And we were speaking in Pensacola, Florida, and Jim showed up with three or four cases of books in the back of his car. They'd just come off the press, and they were his first sales. And we put it out to our mailing list uh, around the country, and all of a sudden, the book was in demand all over the country, and... Uh, that's when Warner Books picked oh. it up, and it became the. It was the number five best-selling book in the world in 1990. What year was it? 95, I think. 93. Whatever year it was. So it only, yeah, it only took two years then, because it was published in 93, is what I saw last night. Yeah. Um. So anyway, it's like this gathering of all my human capital, all of my dense energy knowledge through, you know, techno- technological and this. I get so excited when I get to talking about this. Technological knowledge and um, human capital, people with skills to build and all of this stuff. Um, I actually see maybe not in our lifetimes, I mean, our lifetime, this human lifetime, but um, Heartland being affiliated with it, um, just a miraculous vision is coming for me through all this. It's just gorgeous. And I'm learning how to take a picture of the property that we have now um, and turn that into graphic art to create the vision from there. It's just, cool. I'm listening to music again. I'm into art like nobody's business. Everything is a carving and a sculpting. And I I just really wanted to touch base with you. And I wanted to put out there that anybody that's interested I'm a social worker. I have a lot of connections in the area. I I have a lot of um, not close connections, but a few close connections in that area of people that have been there their whole lives. Um, and 
anyway, I'm just pulling it all together into this one little piece of area I have. I have 2.75 acres. My neighbor has 30-something. My other neighbor has 80-something. My other neighbor, he's a a cattle farmer. I don't know how many acres he has. Um, There's seven acres. There's four acres next to us and then seven acres next to them that will be for sale any day. I think it's waiting for my credit to get straightened out because I've got two houses. I had three and I'm pulling that all together and wrapping it into one loan. I could buy that place oh, well, hold and wrap that all, that it all one falls loan. together. Yeah, so the financial, everything's just coming together. So anyway, uh, just wanted to put that out to the universe strong as strong as I could. So I really just appreciate you being the platform for me to be able to do that. Well, we'll hold the space, and uh, any way we can support you in – your vision, we'll be there to do it. Okay. Thank you so much for helping me get that out clearer. All right, young lady. Blessings. Bye-bye. Miss Jeannie? It's all quiet here, and you're down to two minutes. Okay. Well, why don't we just take two minutes to get quiet and uh, tap into your nafsha. Through your breath, Ruka de Kutcha, that feminine elemental force in us, that by definition in Aramaic undoes the effects of our errors and teaches us the truth, is literally the breath. And so I'm going to invite you to just allow yourself to take a couple of deep breaths. And notice the energy as your breath moves throughout your form. Notice that as you move your breath into your structure, it energizes, it enlivens your structure. Quite literally, the breath of life. And as you tap into that breath and notice how it moves in your structure, allow yourself to become aware of any place in you that when you take your breath in, is not energized. And if you notice that there's any place in you that is not energized by your breath, then consciously, purposely focus on that area of your structure. Take the energy of your breath fully into that part of your structure. When you first start doing that, you may start finding things there that you don't like. And tapping in and moving through those things will be a part of the healing process. So the objective is to integrate everything that we have ever hidden, whether it was ourselves or someone in our ancestry in our genes. And imagine just tapping into the deepest, most powerful love that you can. And then just sit with that each time you take in a breath. Allow that presence of love to to follow your breath into every cell of your structure. Strengthening, healing, living in balance, beauty, love, peace, and abundance. Blessings. Create the best year yet of your eternal life. It is an awesome gift to give the world. <laughs> 